Um, hello, my name is Bruna. I am a PhD candidate at TU Delft, and I will present to you, speaking of archives, the case of Antoni Manerich's photo archive, uh, an interactive and visual approach to sharing its contents and meanings with the community. Sharing a bit about myself, I studied architecture at the Faculty of Architecture of University of Porto, and I completed my master's degree in 2018. In my dissertation, I focused on the intersections between traditional architecture, modern architecture, and sustainable design and building strategies. Since 2019, I hold a scholarship by FCT, uh, Fundação para Ciência e Tecnologia, as a PhD student at the Delft University of Technology, at the Faculty of Architecture and the Built Environment, and I am part of the UNESCO Chair in Heritage and Reshaping of Urban Conservation for Sustainability, or as we call it, uh, Heritage and Values. In uh, 2021, or 2021, I became the scientific coordinator of the photo archive of Antonio Manerge alongside with Pedro Borges de Rojo. The classification and the decoding work of this archive initiated by myself particularly stands for clarifying its meanings and for offering alternative approaches to architectural archives, content, interpretation, and the challenges implied in doing so. Um, so as I mentioned, um, I've been working in the organization and classification process of this archive since uh, 2018. By the time I was writing my master's thesis in Porto and I interviewed Antonio Manet for the first time because I wanted to learn more about his involvement in the survey on Portuguese regional architecture and I wanted to collect information um, on how modern and vernacular architecture shared characteristics that could be interpreted as sustainable. And although this archive um, is not the core of my PhD topic, there's some parallel lines that I must mention. The first one lies, lies on the fact that during the 20th century, several modern architects went on to the field to study vernacular as a source of inspiration, but also as a source of functionality, and in other words, as a source of modernity itself. And in Portugal, the same happened, and Antonio Manejo was part of an incredibly significant survey that was conducted between 55 and 61. Um, and in this survey, 18 architects traveled the country with the mission of photographing vernacular architecture, holding a secret agenda of proving that the idea of a single Portuguese architectural type was a fraud. So within these six teams, Antonio Manejo was part of team one, focusing on the Minho region in the north of the country. And uh, the examples that emerged from this survey um, and the way it was conducted made it incredibly notorious in Portugal and abroad. And what resulted of it, uh, which was a book called Arquitetura Popular in Portugal, was highly influential for the future of Portuguese architecture. So, Going back to Antoni Maneres and how this all of this is related, if I use a very simple timeline, the survey started in 1955, and after this long process that lasted for six years in theory, we end up with the publication of the book that I mentioned called, in English, Popular Architecture in Portugal. It is clever to, con to conclude that this survey was the trigger and it was indeed, that led Antoni Manerge into the lifelong adventure of photographing an entire country for over seven decades to come. But as a matter of fact, the process for him started even before the survey took place, more precisely in 1953, when he took a family trip with his parents to Tras os Montes, also in the north of the country, so that the family could, could visit her parents and so the photos that got him a spot in the survey were taken by him at this point in his life. When I started mapping the contents of the archive was when I was able to actually see how the two, the Portuguese survey and the personal archive of AM, as I call him, Antoni Manej, were closely connected to each other. I started classifying the archive by mapping every photo of the archive, having two big questions in my mind. 
First of all, when were they taken and where were they taken? And the when and where were very important because this is a very active, so to speak, archive. So it is always in use. And as a consequence, a lot of negatives and slides were not in the correct place. Some had been used in lectures over the years, some other others in exhibitions, etc. So just by having the materials available, um, I would not be able to map everything correctly. And for what uh, we can find in the archive, these 60 years of continuous work have resulted in an astonishing variety of materials. As an architecture professor, he built classroom notes where he, we can see which photos were used in a certain lecture at a certain date, sometimes with more detailed information on the typologies to focus on. He also dedicated to photo exhibitions where he shared his own survey, that's how I call it sometimes, the archive, with the community. So the catalogs of the exhibitions hold information written by himself that of course should be undercrossed with the classification work. Um, eventually, I found that somewhere along the way, he had created um, his own code for identifying his slides, which became very handy in terms of understanding that those letters and those numbers actually meant specific places, a sequence and a date, and making some sense out of the dispersed materials. Of course, this was very helpful in mapping the evolution of his activity um, also from the geographical perspective. So if we look at it from the geographical perspective, in the beginning of his working life, he kept pretty much in the northern part of Portugal. Probably he didn't have money for, for, for more travels. But as time progressed, it is possible to see how he started going down onto the southern areas of Portugal, picking different places and regions, sometimes using a funny technique, which was he would go on vacation with his family and then disappear for a few hours to check and photograph vernacular settlements and buildings. By the 80s, something interesting adds to this. By then, he could afford buying color negatives, which meant he could focus not only on the buildings, the people, the daily life, but also on the impact of color in vernacular architecture. And although it seems here that in the 80s, he photographed less than before, when we talk about color slides, we sometimes refer to dossiers with 300 photos each. I said it right, 300. And this discovery process goes on and on because from the 90s onwards, he also starts using reversible negatives, which have not yet been completely mapped by me because, well, I, 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 I face time constraints as well. Um, so, so far I have registered 446 entries, only taking into account the continental area of Portugal. So I am excluding 19 trips to Brazil, Russia, the ex-Portuguese colonies in India and Macau and Greece and the Sush and the Madeira Islands. And to this, another, another challenge can be added, which is time. So, so far from these 446 entries that I have registered, only about, only around 15% of them have been digitized and classified to what I would consider an acceptable degree of detail. So when working with archives and with such specific materials, places and periods in time, Time itself plays a significant role uh, in how successful our work and interpretation might become. And we can't be sure about what's going to happen in the future. The fact is that um, in most of my archival endeavors, I've kept a question in my mind that no one could answer. Apart from the when and the where, the hardest one was why. Okay, this is the why. Why is this project as it is? Why was this photo taken? Taken? Why this building and not the other one? Why is it relevant? Why was it built like this, etc.? It goes on. And this simple question becomes particularly relevant in a time when we are trying to decide what's the best road to travel to make our existence on Earth more sustainable. Um, 
in a time when decision makers are keen to being more engaged with the communities and providing spot on solutions to real problems. And so archives hold valuable information that play a significant role in achieving transparency, accountability, participation. So they should be open, available, and they should be looked as more dynamic than they still are at the present time. So another challenge came to my mind after having everything organized, collected and interpreted, which is not, what is the use of this information? What is the future of all this knowledge? How can we overcome the limits of an archival drawer? And this is when the challenges became the possibilities and the final idealistic question arose. What if archives could speak? The author of this archive is still alive, although he is already 92 years old. Of course, he plans to live uh, until his 120s, but we can't be sure if that's going to be possible. So I was worried about the whys of this archive and how we would be able to collect them, considering the technical limitations of a 92 year old man and the fact that he might not live long enough to be able to write his own story. I'm not being dramatic, this is a reality. So my main concern was turned into my model. Let's speak of archives then. This is where once again, my PhD research crosses my role as the, archi the archives scientific coordinator and oral history comes to play a crucial part here. I was able to convince Antonio Maneres to being interviewed by myself and to get aboard a series of oral history conversations where we would discuss where the photos were taken, what was the focus of each photo and why um, was that relevant. On my side, taking what I've done up until this point, the remaining question was, what's next? What can we do with so much potential information? How can we decode it? How can we interpret it? So instead of jumping into risky interpretations that could be wrong, I didn't see what he saw. I can't go back. Most of these buildings don't exist anymore. I could be recording his own memories and testimonies and save it so that future generations can have the same privilege as I did of listening to the architect himself talking about his own work. And once the dots started um, to be connected, I confirmed that in 1953, these photos taken in Trazos Montes were his passport for participating in the survey in Portuguese regional architecture. I also found that while the survey was still being conducted, he had some parallel visits to the same places, um, intriguingly that he would frequently carry two cameras, one for the survey and another for his of his own. So also I found out that some interesting people such as the Pritzker um, architect Cesar Vieira was his travel companion in some of these travels. Cesar is in this picture as you can see. So it is also not a surprise that later he would have donated some of his personal photos to be integrated into the book of the survey. Another an expected piece of information comes as a complement to a critique that Anthony Manej himself addresses to his own participation on the survey in the 50s. Um, some typologies ended up being left out or less covered because they did not know about them and they didn't have time left to go back and to make those photos anymore. So when the survey was finished, um, he received a research grant from Fundação um, Gulbenkian to go back and photograph more architectural typologies and make a report about them. Later, Pedro Borges de Araújo, uh, has a former colleague of AM, shared a plan of a project that was designed in Antonio Manetti's studio in 1962. So the archive was always present in the studio's daily life. In this case, he annotated um, the position of the photos he took from the same houses so that the team could see the specific photos and take them as an inspiration for the design process. Another case is the case of the Lidin de Furna, which he photographed 
1965. By then, the villagers already knew that the village was going to disappear somewhere in the 70s. Um, some people had already abandoned their houses uh, because the government was going to build um, a dam and therefore this village was going to get flooded. This is particularly special because nowadays, only in times of extreme lack of water, the water levels go down sufficiently so that we can see what's left of it. So, in an effort to make other people see what I see, I've been trying to contribute as much and as fast as possible to provide solutions for the issues that I have encountered in archives myself in general so far. We've been served enough in terms of digitization of data, storage, and shareability when possible and when institutions decide to make information available. So shareability combined with a big set of ifs. But if what, we've also been served a big deal of uncertainty, we'll still have no clue what's, been, what's, what's the meaning behind most of the archival materials available. And this is very risky. So my concern um, this is, is what does not happen with everything in between, how information gets shared at the final stage of this process and what happens as a consequence of that particularly because um, then we might be wasting valuable opportunities to engage in enriching joint discussions. Um, of course, I know I am in a position to say this because in this case, the architect is alive and we can use his memories to help decode the meanings of the archive. But even, but even in other situations where only family members and friends are available, there's uh, knowledge that could and should be collected and it simply gets lost. So my contribution to this discussion has to be focused on these missing steps of the archival classification, which according to my own experience could be tackled through the digitization phase as it is at the moment, but adding the collection of testimonies either from primary or secondary involved actors, the transcription of these testimonies, the analysis, the codification of these testimonies, the identification of patterns, connections, and networks, and then the shareability of the interconnected data. This would provide a much more solid ground for an enriched and enriching usage of these materials by the public and the beneficial and useful participation of this knowledge in public life. So once again, in a parallel with my PhD, I've been focusing my efforts in understanding what's been photographed and why, meaning what does it add to the cultural significance of vernacular heritage and how can we use it? And of course, as I stated before, the more we discuss the photos of Antonio Munez, the more we see that it is deeply rooted in the evolution of Portuguese architecture in the 20th century. So the people involved in contributing to that evolution and the events that took place. And so by looking at it in such a way, two outputs came to my mind. One being the network in which this archive is included. And for this, network visualization softwares have been a huge, huge help. And the other one, apart from finding a way to connect all the data, is finding a way to share it as visually as possible with the community, promoting a reflection, a discussion, and an interpretation based on the original oral data shared by the archives author. In the beginning, I referred to the modernist architect's travels as a way to gain knowledge on vernacular settlements. And of course, after so many conversations, the more we get to know AM's work, the more we have to agree that it has similar character to those other travels or surveys or endeavors, whatever we would like to call them. So throughout these decades, Antonio Manej not only took pictures, but did it surrounded um, by family, friends, colleagues, peers. He participated in congresses. He took action as an advocate for heritage and built an archive that is way more than just a set of photos. So it reflects a tight network filled with lots and lots of information. So, well, we, we can go further and further with this. What I am doing on the present time is I am still collecting the architect's testimonies while 
attributing the geo coordinates of each negative or slide um, entity. In an ideal situation, uh, the future steps to be made are to expand into a dynamic and engaging system where people can use interactive maps that hold all this information and also where people are able to share their own pieces of information to continue enriching the decoding of this. Of course, I, I am still pretty much involved in making visualizations possible through the collection of all kinds of information and building a proper data set, which is also what we usually don't have uh, in, in, in this context. Um, and I am not yet into publicly into the part where I public, publicly share the archive and the collected data. So for now, it still comes as a good intention, but eventually we will get there. Having that said, I also looked at this conference as an opportunity to listen to more experienced people and to hearing other people's thoughts on this matter. So I am pretty much available and interested in receiving comments, feedback, and replying to any questions you might have. So with this, I finished my presentation and I would like to thank you for your attention and for the opportunity you gave me. Thank you very much. Thank you. We ha still have some question time. Are there any questions from the audience? No one has questions. I have one question for you, Bruna. I was yeah. just wondering, um, this is one ex very beautiful example. Um, what would be your advice if other people would like to do something similar with an artist um, that had made heritage uh, available for, for, for very, very many years? How, what, what, would, what would be your best advice for them? Um, first of all, first of all, to be very transparent in terms of what the intention behind it and what we all could gain from it. Uh, taking my experience, what I know for sure is that these older guys, these old people, they are very, very, very uh, interested in sharing their experiences and all the knowledge that they have gathered throughout the years. So sometimes younger people find it hard to, well, to sit down and to listen to a three hour conversation or to, well, which is usually what I have to do. I have to sit down and talk for three hours with yeah. them, yeah. but you always end up learning so much. Um, and there's always a connection between a lots of, 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 of information and different contexts. So first of all, to be transparent and to do it as fast as possible and in a very natural way, because they really just want to share what they know. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, there's one question, just a moment. David Fugel. Um, how, how do you record what you hear exactly? Do you, do you uh, videotape these sessions and then how do you, do you get it to paper or what's the path from there? Because there's still a lot of labor from your memory or the videotape into an actual documentation. Yeah, I don't know if I got it correctly, but you are asking how do I process the information after yeah. I collect it? Okay, yeah. so I usually uh, videotape and voice record, record all the meetings. Um, and also, I always keep track of the photos we are discussing. And for that, I've used Zoom because I can uh, make a, a double recording of the meeting. After that, I do transcribe all the, the entire recording. Um, and, and that's important because, of course, there's a lot of information that I won't be able to, to remember. So I do transcribe it. And I also perform um, content analysis. And for that, I've been using Atlas TI, which is a content analysis software. So I use qualitative methods to, to make my analysis. So prior to jumping into my conclusions and to my own analysis, so I try to avoid the cherry picking risk by analyzing everything that they, that they said. Uh, using the transcripts and the softwares for content analysis. Okay. And, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> we're a bit of out of time, but <laughs> if if you, um, I'm sure your presentation will be shared and um, also with your contact details, so people can ask yeah. you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so you much. Thank again. you. Can I have a hand of applause, please? <laughs>